on an examination, the first vitals is going to be DTS 12060, pulse rate is 84, and respiratory rate is 16, which is quite stable, and the hydration is adequate. This routine rate investigation was done, and it showed NS1 is positive. And the plate rate is around 2.0 lakhs, and its total count is 3,200. Currently, the patient is in the febrile phase of his illness. Other than that, there is no warning signs or bleeding manifestation, and the patient is quite comfortable and uh, easily uh, totally stable patient. So, the first thing that we should is notice whether this patient needs admission or it can be managed as an OP basic patient. OP, OP. definitely. If the patient doesn't need any admission because his vitals are stable and everything is good. So, in a dengue patient, what are the criteria for a domiciliary pass? This is next. So, the patient's stay, uh, vitals is the first thing. The patient should not have any tachycardia or hypotension. There should be a no, no, no narrow pulse pressure and no bleeding and the plate count should be more than 1 lakh so that we can manage the patient in domiciliary care. Suppose if this there is any abnormalities in these parameters, the patient definitely needs an IP admission. Apart from this, if there is a persistent high grade fever of more than 40 degrees Celsius also, the patient may need an IP admission for the monitoring. So, how, how are we going to manage these patients? Just adequate hydration with oral fluids is enough. And antipyretics, acetaminophen is a paracetamol is going to be the primary choice of antibiotic treatment. Whether antibiotics is needed in this case? No. No. So, then what are the advice that we are going to inform the patient? Since we are going to manage the patient in the domiciliary care. So, okay, adequate fluids is the first thing that we have to advise the patients. Next, the patient should be in a regular follow-up with us so that we can monitor whether the patient is going in for thrombocytopenia or hematocrit rise or any other complications. Then, adequate explanation regarding the warning signs and bleeding manifestation is important to the patient. Then, uh, most of the patients, paracetamol won't reduce the fever in dengue most of the cases. So, they may land up in getting an NSH from the OTC, which can lead to bleeding manifestation also. So, it's of prime importance to advise them not to take an NSH or aspirin as an OTC drug. Because these impacts have antiplatelet actions, so which can further cause bleeding risks. Then, avoid IM injection as a routine work. Cleaning places. Coming to second case, a 42 years male gentleman, he has also been diagnosed with a dengue, which is fever, and initially for four days, and now he is safe for the past two days. So his current status is going to be in a critical phase of the disease. Two days is a safe phase. So his blood parameters on the day three, day four, day five, day six has been explained. There is a serial plate drop of 75,000, 60,000, 30,000, and 19,000. Gradually, it started rising on the day 7 to 23,000. However, the patient had stable, vitals were stable and he didn't develop any complications, no warning signs or no bleeding manifestation and nothing. So, at the, anyway, at the, by the end of the day 6, the patient developed generalized itching with a non-blanching rash in bilateral lower limb. So, on the next day, that is during the day 7, the patient has developed a fever spikes of around 100 degree current. So, this is the case as of now. So the patient had ate a breakfast for the two days, then he developed a fever on the day 7-3. So the, the diagnosis is going to be patient is in the recovery phase actually. Dengue recovery phase with recovery rash. So the rash in dengue can happen both in the febrile phase and in the recovery phase also. And the recovery phase rash is typically a non-blanching rash and there will be a generalized itching also. So, since there is a new fever spike, whether any, any antibiotics is needed, no. And uh, since the platelet has reached uh, 19,000, however the plate, patient is stable, whether plate transmission is needed for this patient, no. So, what need to be done for this patient is adequate hydration and uh, anti students can be given for his itching and routine platelet and hematocrit monitoring. Since he is still in the critical phase, 48 hours of the safe febrile phase, then vitals monitoring and then just a reassurance that the itching and the rash will go on its own and nothing need to be bothered and reassurance is the first thing for this patient. Is papaya extract is it useful? Ma'am, actually studies have uh, shown okay, diverse uh, role ma'am. 50 50. So, they will take it anyway. They believe what's up more than you. Huh? They believe what's the video for me? Consider it in 11 book assignment, everything is like that.
and more patients are coming with gastritis after drinking this on your home. So, next is indication for platelet transfusion is dengue. So, the ideal indication by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare of India is prophylactic transfusion is needed only if the platelet count is less than 10,000. If it is more than 10,000, if there is any active bleeding such as melina or bleeding gums or any subcutaneous ecchymosis sort of thing, we can transfuse the patient. Otherwise, there is no ideal indication for platelet transfusion. Even if you are going to give the patient also, it's going to be destroyed again. And uh, if there, there is any plan for transfusion, single donor platelet is better than isolated transfusion because there is for multiple exposures and antibody synthesis is comparatively lesser with single donor platelets. Next is case 3. Uh, here a 36 year old young male or female on day 5 of a debut and is an a febrile phase for the day 1. He developed persistent vomiting and abdominal pain and has the following clinical features. On examination, he has a cold periphery. His vitals are 80 bar 60 and pulse rate is 136 per minute. His respiratory rate is quite on the higher end, 24 per minute, and his capillary refilling time is more than 2 seconds. So, the best thing, capillary refilling time is a bedside procedure which can be done easily so that we can know whether the patient is going in for a shock or not before recording a BP also. Then, on examination, his respiratory system, there is a reduced air entry on the right infraxillary region. And per abdomen, there was right hypochondrial tenderness, but there is no body and no LGBT as well. So, his routine blood investigations, his total count was gradually on the rising in 2500 to 3200 on the day 5 of the fever. And his platelet is on the day 3 is 1.45 lakhs, gradually it's dropped to 75,000 and 36,000. His hematocrit is 42, 41, and 46. So, he is in a hemoconcentration state as of now. So, the IV fluids. So when the US abdomen is done and it's oxidized with G V O demand pilot minimum full eruption. So there is the evidence of third space fluid loss. So it is an ideal case of dengue hemorrhagic fever. So and the, since the patient is in shock 8060, it's a dengue hemorrhagic fever with shock syndrome. So how to manage? So before going to managing this patient, I will just describe about managing of routine patients. I hope it's visible. Okay. So, the patient can be divided into hemorrhagic phase grade to 1, 2, 3 and 4. Suppose if it is going to be a 1 or 2, the patient is going to be quite stable. There won't be any shock or there won't be any obvious bleeding manifestation in these patients. So, these patients should be, there will be a hemoconcentration in these patients, which is an indication for static fluids for them. So, initial fluids are 6 mg per kg per hour for 1 to 2 hours. After that, we have to see for improvement. How is this? Hematocrite, how is the clinical improvement, how are the symptoms? Followed by, if there is any, there is improvement, we can start, reduce the crystalloid fluids from 6 ml to 3 ml per kg per hour. Further, if there is improvement, we can discontinue the fluid by 24 hours. Suppose if there is going to be no improvement to the initial fluids, we can increase the fluid by 10 ml per kg per hour for a duration of 2 hours. Further, if there is improvement, we can reduce it gradually and titrate it over a period of 24 to 48 hours. So, once the patient has been if there is no improvement and there is unstable vital signs, so that is his BP is dropping and his pulse rate is getting higher in dengue grade 1 and grade 2, we have to look for his hematocrites. Suppose if the hematocrite is rising, we can transfuse them with colloids also. However, crystalloids are preferred over colloids. If the crystalloids is not going to work, we can go with colloids. However, if the hematocrite falls, the patient may need a blood transfusion. Since the hematocrite fall is the indication for it, internal bleeding, so these patient needs blood transfusion. Followed by if the patient is improving with these two things, they can be managed with crystalloids and uh, they should be maintained in the fluids for a minimum of 24 to 48 hours. So the next thing is going to be for grade 3 and grade 4 hemorrhagic fevers. So usually there will be an unstable vital signs for these, uh, these patients. In grade 4, it, grade 3 is going to be a narrow pulse pressure, grade 4 is going to be a frank shock actually. So these patients need an immediate fluid resuscitation. So the fluid requirements may be 10 to 20 ml per kg per hour for the first hour. Then we have to reassess the patients. How is their BP? How is their pulse pressure? How is their urine output? Everything. If there is going to be an improvement, we can successively reduce the IF fluid requirements by gradually from 20 to 10, 10 to 6, 6 to 3. It's just a Thailand based. We can also reduce this 10 to 7, 7 to 3 any basis. Next, with further improvement, we can discontinue the fluids after 24 hours. 
considering if there is no improvement and the patient is in persistent shock. So, then what need to be done is, patient should be given adequate oxygenation since the patient is in shock to improve the oxygenation to the peripheral tissues. Next, the thing which need to monitor is, is going to be a hematocrit. So, so, considering our hematocrit, if the hematocrit is considered to the previous hematocrit, if our hematocrit is going to rise, it's still due to hemoconcentration. So, these patients should be given colloids. So, colloid dextrin is preferred, which is also given as 10 ml per kg per hour transfusion. If needed, it can be repeated also. If the patient is having persistent hematocrit rise and the BP is not improving, we can give a colloid also. Consider the hematocrit is false rapidly. It may be considered as an internal hemorrhage. These patients should be given blood transfusion immediately at the rate of 10 ml per kg per hour. So, if the patient is going for improvement, no issues, nothing to worry most of the times. We can gradually reduce the crystalloids or colloids whichever we are giving and monitor the patients. Considering if the patient falls further worsens and the BP is not improving and he is developing bleeding manifestation, most of the time dengue hemorrhage fever, one person patient can land up in this sort of serious complications. They need to be managed as DIC patients, blood transfusion, platelet transfusion and FFP transfusion, everything may be needed for them. So, in this patient our diagnosis is dengue hemorrhage fever grade 4 or uh, dengue shock syndrome. So, initially we can give the fluid with 20 ml per kg per hour for the first hour. After resuscitation also, if the BP is improving, nothing to worry. Can, suppose consider a scenario where the patient's BP is not improving. It's around 84 bar 60 and the pulse rate is still on the higher end. So what need to be done? So repeat hematocrit need to be applied for this patient. So our day 5 morning blood morning uh, hematocrit is going to be 46. However, the after fluid resuscitation, our hematocrit is going to be 36 and there's a drop in HP also. So this indicates there is a internal bleeding. So this patient needs immediate blood transfusion of 10 ml per kg. So this can uh, improve the BP and patient can be saved. Actually, this is a imaginated case scenario, so I am no uh, not a final safe for this patient. Okay. So that's all for uh, dengue actually. Coming to malaria, which is the second common tropical fever that we are dealing with in Chennai actually. So consider a 46 years male with high grade fever associated with Sinsen Raiga, diagnosed to have Plasmodium vivax malaria actually in QVC. His vitals are stable, his blood parameters are normal and no complications. So he's going to have an uncomplicated vivax malaria. So what's the treatment for this malaria? Since the patient is a domiciliary care, patient can be managed. So the treatment is going to be a chloroquine for 25 mc per kg. Actually this needs to be divided as 10, 10, 5 or 10, 5, 5, 5. It can be given as any basis. So, suppose if you are going to plan as 10, 10, 5, the chloroquine phosphate, which, ha, which is 500 mg tablets, has 300 mg of base chloroquine. So, this 300 mg is the thing that we are going to calculate. 25 mg per kg is going to be a base sequence. So, 500 mg of tablet contains 300 mg of chloroquine. So, these tablets can be given as 2, 2, 1. Suppose if you are planning for 10, 5, 5, 5, 2, 1, 1, and 1. So, the first tablet 2 is going to be on the The first two is going to be stacked. The next uh, one tablet is going to be, we, have, we should be giving it in a 12 hours. The next is going to be given in 24 hours. The next is going to be given as 48 hours actually. Suppose if you are planning for 2111 regimen. So, whether chloroquine itself is going to totally remove the malaria from our body, definitely no. So, if it's going to be Vivax or Oval, we definitely need a radical cure for these patients. Which is going to be a primaquine. So, in India, we are giving the doses as 0.25 mg per kg. So, this should be given for maximum for 14 days so that there will be no relapse of the malaria. Being in an endemic country, it's definitely a radical cure need to be given for this patient's action. So, considering the same patient, after we have started him on chloroquine and we are giving him primaquine also. So, the patient had persistent fever after 72 hours that is completing the three doses of chloroquine and the repeat QBC is also positive. And we have ruled out all other uh, sort of infections. Dengue, which is a common COVID infection in this patient, it has been ruled out. So, what can be the possibilities in this case? Resistance. So, possibly it is due to resistance to chloroquine. So, chloroquine resistance should be suspected when after 72 hours of the treatment, if the patient is having more than 25 percentage of the parasite load, we can suspect chloroquine resistance. Otherwise, even with treatment completion and the patient is safe, 
After seven days, even if the parasitemia is minimal in QVC, we can suspect that the malaria is resistant to chloropine. So, coming to the treatment for uh, resistant malaria is going to be, there are three treatments, but which is the easiest for us is going to be ACT combination drugs with the primaquine. Other things that can be given is going to be quinine can also be used. If whenever you are using quinine, it should be combined with the doxy or clindamycin for treating a resistant malaria. Other drug, mefloquine, which is a higher compared to chloroquine, can also be given, which can be given as 750 mg stand followed by 500 mg cola support. Two doses is enough for if they are going to give a mefloquine tablet. So, the same patient, however, become afebrile with chloroquine tablet, but uh, he is on primaquine for 5 days. Now, the patient's complaint is going to be nausea, vomiting, brown color urine, jaundice, and abdominal pain. So, what can be due to? So, possibly primaquine induced hemolytic can, can also be there. So, primaquine, whenever it is being, being given in G6PD deficiency, it can lead to severe hemolytic anemia. So, it should be kept in mind whenever a primaquine is given to the patient, these patients should be monitored. So, the other common complication of primaquine is going to be methemoglobinemia. So, certain patients can come back again to you with breathlessness, not with this complaints. Patient can come to you with breathlessness, this saturation may be normal, ABC normal, X-ray normal, everything may be normal. So, it may be due to methemoglobin. So, these two complications should be kept in mind whenever we are giving a patient the chloroquine. But how common is G6PD? Sir, very less. Two. It's more than Africa. But however, methemoglobinemia is occurring, sir. We have seen patients with methemoglobin. So, the thing to be done is we have to stop the drug and adequate hydration. If the HB is too low, we can transfuse for the patient. And we have to hold it. Monit uh, obtain a G6PD level for this patient so, so we can label them and we can avoid any drugs which can cause hemolytic anemia in G6PD deficiencies. So, how to prevent? So, we can measure currently, definitely, media is not needed. In the foreign countries, they, are, they will be measuring G6PD levels for the patient, then only they will be giving them primaquine. In a mild deficiency, we can give primaquine, however, the dosage will be a different dose. 0.75 mg per kg once a week for 8 weeks can be given. In severe deficiency, chloropine is definitely a contraindicate. So, the other drugs that can be used in chloropine uh, responsive malaria is going to be amodiaquine, which is the, the dose of 10 mg per kg for 3 days. Apart from primaquine, there is one other drug which can be used for radical cure, which is tefnoquine, which can be given as a 300 mg single dose. However, the risk for G6PD deficiency with tefnoquine is much more compared to chloropine. Sorry, primaquine. So, a 10, 10 weeks gestation pregnant lady who has been diagnosed with malaria with a blood test and a investigations and vitals, everything are within normal range. So, how will we manage this patient? If the patient is having to, smear is going to be positive for a vivax malaria. So, similarly, chloroquine phosphate is going to be given. So, whether primaquine can be given in this scenario? No. Contraindicated in pregnancy. So, what should be done to prevent relapse in this sort of patients? So, uh, no, tefloquine can also be not be can also be taken. So, in order to prevent relapse, the thing that can be done is we can give suppressive prophylaxis until pregnancy is over with chloroquine alone, 5 mg per kg weekly dose until delivery. We can uh, give the patient after delivery. We can give the pair. Protocol says G6PD status of the mother and child needs to be done, but it's difficult in our scenario. So, after delivery, we can give the patient primaquine tablets. So, suppose if the same patient pregnant lady has a smear positive for falciparum malaria, what will be our treatment? So, in that scenario, if the, since it is a 10 weeks of gestation, it's a first trimester. During first trimester, compared to ACT, quinine is preferable. However, if quinine is not obtainable and difficult, not accessible, we can still give ACT combination drugs also for this patients. So, quinine at a dose of 10 mg per kg plus clindamycin 600 mg for 7 days need to be given if it is going to be passive malaria and if the patient is coming in a first trimester. So, in a pregnant lady, 
Chloroquine sensitive patient, in the first trimester you can do chloroquine and second and third trimester chloroquine no issues. However, if the patient is resistant, malaria is resistant to chloroquine, in the first trimester quinine is going to be the drug of choice, second and third trimester is going to be a ACT drugs. In Falciparum, the first trimester the drug of choice is going to be quinine, quinine and clintamicin. In second and third trimester is going to be a ACT drugs. So the final case in malaria actually. So we have 15 years old female, known case of hypertension, was brought with chief complaints of high grade fever, breathlessness and auto sensorium. She was drowsy, not oriented and afebrile, with pulse rate of 102, BP1, 16 plus 67 and respiratory rate of 32 and saturation is totally normal 98%. However, she is quite breathless. And her breathing pattern is rapid and deep, a sign of Kushma's breathing pattern. And however, her RS is no added sounds are seen, no crepitations or no wheels, nothing. So her routine blood investigations, total count was 7200, plate rate was 82,000, HB 7.5, hematocrite is 28, total bilirubin is 3.2, and direct bilirubin is 1.2, and indirect bilirubin is 2.0. Indirect bilirubin is slightly higher than that of the direct bilirubin actually. Then urine ketone is negative, and RBS is 82, RFT is normal, chest x ray normal, and LDH is double one two three. So, this is a patient with cerebral malaria. malaria and ABGS, metabolic acidosis and peripheral smear showed falciparum malaria with high parasitic meat clothes and usually is serving splenomegaly. So, this is going to be a complicated falciparum malaria. So, the treatment for a complicated falciparum malaria in this setting is going to be first, since there is acidosis, adequate hydration is needed most important for this patient. And the patient is drowsy and the, she was not able to take any oral food. So, it's better to give her IV drugs. IV artisunate at a dose of 2.4 mg per kg should be given. The dosing should be on 0 hours, followed by 12 hours and 24 hours. After that, OD as 48 hours and 72 hours we should be giving. Suppose if the patient is improving at some point of time, we should change from IV to oral drug, ACT regimens. Because it's preferable to give us ACT combination therapy compared to isolated drugs because to prevent resistance in future. Suppose if artisun artisunate is not available, sorry it's artisunate, we can use RT meter also which is the dose given as 3.2 mg per kg stat followed by 1.6 mg per kg as OD dose daily. So and this patient need a broad spectrum antibiotic coverage also because in severe malaria there is higher chances of gram negative cells associated with malaria. So in order to prevent the patient from landing into complications further, it's important to treat these patients with broad spectrum antibiotics to cover non uh, typhoidal salmonella coverage. Then, since her platelet is around, sorry, HP is around 7.5, and the patient is in acidosis, blood transfusion may be needed for this patient, and continuous monitoring is needed. And if the patient's sensorium and general conditions improved after 48 hours, we can change from IV to oral ACD and complete the treatment for three days course. So it's important that after the patient is improving to complete the course with their oral ACT regimens. So the available ACT combination drugs are there are totally five approved WHO approved drugs in which RT meter and lumifantin are most commonly used, which is given at a dose of 1.5 or 9 mg per kg. It's given as a BD dose for three days. The most common brain name is Lumirax actually. The other drugs which can be used is RT sunate plus sulfadoxin pyrimethamine. In this drug, however, artisunate should be given for 3 days. Sulfadoxin and pyrimethamine is a single dose actually. Day 1 alone you should be giving. So its dosage is going to be 4, 21 and 1.25. So this can be, this is available as a total complete kit, larinate kit, which has 3 days uh, tablet as separately. On the day 1 it contains sulfadoxin and pyrimethamine, however the day 2 and day 3 drugs, it won't be available. The other drugs are artisunate and mefloquine, artisunate and amodiaquine and dihydroartemisin with pyfepiprimine. So what are the need of antibiotics in malaria? So just as I have already mentioned, severe uncomplicated malaria definitely needs antibiotics and if the parasitemia is more than 20 percentage, definitely it needs antibiotics. If it is going to be algid malaria, malaria with shock and gram negative sepsis is called algid malaria and the patient is you are treating the patient, however they are not responding or unexpectedly deteriorating with treatment, you can start these patients with antibiotics. So, case 7. 
36 years old female diagnosed with leptospirosis has a history of fever panic with suspicion and melina based on the history without even without lab investigation also panic with suspicion can indicate the patient is having leptospirosis is present in melina bleeding gums so bleeding gums patient is having a hemorrhagic manifestations on examination the patient is sick and tachypneic so patient is also having a jaundice on her bp was around 90 60 pulse rate is 112 per minute respiratory rate 29 saturation is 92 percentage in room and rs has scattered fits so the patient is going to be a patient with mots ards and liver failure and hemorrhagic manifestation typical case of aids disease the blood parameters is going to be total count is 15800 platelet is 45000 however it is lower end but it's not too low then total bilirubin is 6.7 direct bilirubin 5.0 Mm, with urea and creatinine of 94 and 2.1 there is a aka also in this patient actually yeah. then sodium is 130 and potassium is 3.0 hypokalemia is typically seen in dengue sorry leptospirosis due to tubular injury caused by leptospirosis how the urine output is 1.8 liters per day which is more than adequate for the patient so the aka can be monitored gradually and inr is 3.4 there is a bleeding due to diastasis in this patient The A B C showed type one respiratory failure with P A O two by F A O two ratio of one fifty. So the typical is Berlin criteria wise is A R D S two. So this is a case of severe leptospirosis with marks. So the management is going to be just as all patients. Fluid management is going to be the prime importance. Then since the patient is in A R D S, nasal O two if it is not sufficient, patient may need N I V support also based on the clinical status. The drug of choice for severe leptospirosis is going to be zone one gram OD can be given or doxy two hundred mg stat followed by hundred mg BD can be given for seven days. Since the patient is bleeding disorder and is high NRS on the higher end, he may need FOP transfusion also in this scenario. Zone so, according to body weight. Eleven one gram OD. Even if he is obese, actually one gram itself is sufficient gram. Other than that, for this infection, leptospirosis. For leptospirosis. And overall, zone two gram sodium and one gram sodium comparative studies claim me even the body weight difference also zone one gram has equal efficacy with zone two gram. So my article is there. So suppose if the patient is a mild case, oral treatment is more than sufficient. Oral doxy 100 mg BG for seven days and amoxicillin 500 mg QAD for seven days. So the thing is the duration of the treatment should be given properly, not just for five days. The treatment is going to be for seven days in the first five doses cases. So, 52 years old female from rural village, present with fever, reduced urine output, and jaundice. So, uh, patient is from a rural background with fever and reduced urine output. There is definitely some renal impairment going on over here, and jaundice. And the patient is vital signs stable. However, the patient is having fetal edema and yes, sir, in left axilla, which already previous speaker has explained. Typical of script typhus. So, RS examination there are basal scripts in bilateral. Low level uh, inferior axillary regions. So I gym scrub for typhus has been done, which is shown to be positive. So it's a typical case of scrub with routine investigations. Total count is going to be fifteen thousand four hundred. Later eight thousand. Mm, apart from that, the LFT is normal. RFT urea is one eight and creatinine six point one. Iron are normal. Chest X-ray showed increased bronchial respiratory monitoring, and the urine output is one fifty ml per day. So the patient is in oliguric renal failure. And A B G showed metabolic acidosis. So the diagnosis is scrub typhus with oligonic type of renal failure. Compli common complication of scrub is going to be a renal failure actually. So what's the treatment for this patient? Since the patient has developed fetal edema and bilateral basal scrubs, she is currently in a polymorphic state. So fluid restriction is an important thing, and renal replacement therapy is also important since the patient is having acidosis and the urine output is less than 150 ml per day with. Associated urea creatinine is on the higher. So, what is the treatment for severe scrub? Just like lepto, IV drug is the drug of choice for patient with scrub, severe scrub also. So, IV doxy 200 mg stat followed by 100 mg BD for 7 to 15 days is the ideal treatment. So, this later transfusion needed for this patient? No. Yeah, because it is pseudo thrombocytopenia. Pseudo thrombocytopenia is due to there will be anti-platelet antibody formed in the body. Which with EDTA causes agglutination in the sample, which leads to pseudo thrombocytopenia. There won't be any bleeding manifestation in scrub as 
Good papers. No, ma'am. And until there is improving clinical, his renal parameters are improving, output is improving, clinical improvement replacing with RRT. Like other AKIs, this patient can also land up in CKD also. Will it reverse? Reverse. But still, like other AKIs, this can also be non reversible also in certain cases. The background of diabetes, background of real pain is already. Other than this, we are sending. Only 10%? 10%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The recovery is good only, sir, actually. If uh, timely management is given. So, if the similar to lepto, if the patient is going to be a mild case, oral doxy, 100 mg BD for 7 to 50 days, or azithro, which is a short course treatment, 500 mg, 3 days can also be given. So, based on this, doxy can, in any tropical fever in being in India, we can treat the patient without, if we, we are not sure with what is the diagnosis, what is the etiology, nothing wrong in giving the doxy. Because it will be covering most of the atypical organisms, bacteria, and uh, the scrub and leptospirosis also, which is the common mix. So, can taking mother, we can do acetone? Yes, ma'am. Prophylaxis also, if you are planning, means uh, acetone is going to be preferable for her. Thank Okay, because uh, Dr. Rahul Sakratri of Ayam and Chennai, I told you, I know Mehmet Dr. Hadson.